the United States has spent trillions of dollars on subsidies for renewable energy, and it's had a very small impact in terms of the percentage of energy provided from those renewable technologies. Keeping our republic is on the line, and it requires patriots with great passion, dedication, and eternal vigilance to preserve our freedoms. Jenny Beth Martin is the co-founder of Tea Party Patriots. She is an author, a filmmaker, and one of Time Magazine's most influential people in the world. But the title she is most proud of is mom to her boy-girl twins. She has been at the forefront, fighting to protect America's core principles for more than a decade. Welcome to The Jenny Beth Show. The far left Sierra Club once called my next guest one of the greatest single threats our planet has ever faced. He is an expert on climate, energy, and the environment. Myron Ebel is a senior fellow at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. He was perhaps the most influential individual who helped pull America out of the Paris Climate Accords, and he is leading the fight against climate change hysteria. Myron Ebel, thank you so much for joining me today. You do so much amazing work fighting back against President Biden's war on energy. Talk to us a bit about what is going on and what is he doing and how do you think he's declared war on energy? Thanks, Jenny Beth. Uh, President Biden and basically all of the Democratic Party uh, has declared war on affordable and reliable energy. And not only just electricity, but also the, the kind of cars we drive, uh, the production of energy as well as the use of energy. So it's, it's a very broad scale effort and it involves both uh, subsidies. Uh, it passed in the Inflation Reduction Act last year without, if you'll recall it, not a single Republican voted for the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, and uh, that bill provides massive subsidies for the renewable energy and electric vehicles and so on. And then uh, second uh, are the regulations, the rules to, to try to limit the production and use of uh, conventional fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas. Why are the subsidies such a problem? Well, the subsidies is essentially have been around for a long time for wind, solar, some other uh, unconventional types of energy, uh, and also for uh, people who buy an electric vehicle. But what the Inflation Reduction Act did was it made them essentially permanent. Instead of renewing them or extending them for a couple of years, uh, the so-called Inflation Reduction Act said these are going to go on forever until our economy reaches net zero. Uh, and so uh, this fully funds the climate industrial complex. Uh, the, the, the people who are uh, making money off of types of energy that can't make it in the marketplace, that aren't commercially viable, but get subsidies, they now have they can see as far as they can see in, into the horizon, this is going to be a money maker. There's no way you can lose money on building a wind plantation or a solar plantation because of the federal subsidy. It's, Not because <clears throat> because it is competitive, but simply because the government will pay for it no matter what. Yes, and uh, and the consequence of that is that our electric grid is becoming increasingly unreliable uh, and electric rates are going up. So California's electric rates are far above the national average. They've been pursuing these policies for many years. Uh, and, and so we can see what's happening. They have high electric rates. In Texas, <clears throat> which uh, G Governor George W. Bush in 1999, uh, at the urging of Ken Lay of Enron, you remember that name? Yeah. Uh, Enron, uh, Ken Lay uh, convinced Governor Bush that uh, a lot of money could be made from the federal wind subsidy because North Texas and West Texas are very windy places. And so Texas now has a huge overinvestment over several decades now uh, in wind and underinvestment in conventional power plants. They've closed most of their coal-fired power plants. They haven't built enough gas plants. And they've got all this wind and uh, the problem that they face is not high rates. Their rates have not gone up that much. The problem that they face is that it gets hot in Texas in the summer. Demand goes way up when people turn their air conditioning on. And uh, the wind doesn't blow very much in the summer. 
So Texas now faces a terrible future unless unless the uh, elected officials in, in, in the legislature would actually take the issue seriously. So far, they've they've they're they're more or less controlled by by big wind now, and wow. and uh, you would they, think it's big oil, but it's no, big it's wind. big wind. Yeah. Wow. No, and the and the oil industry because they're not involved in the electric grid. They they're not you know running the grid. They haven't asserted themselves into the debate and said, hey, wait a minute, uh, you know, this, you can't run a modern economy on expensive electricity that's only on part of the time. Um, okay, so that's what's happening in Texas. I th- I've driven, I've been all over this country, flown all over the country. I have hundreds of thousands of sky miles each year <laughs> um so it it's crazy so i but my point is i wind up seeing a lot of these solar the solar mm-hmm. farms and the wind farms but if i just lived in say metro atlanta atlanta metro the metro area of atlanta I, you wouldn't even see them so right. you know if you're not if you're in, and if you just go visit like new york or or la or whatever you know yeah. you're not going to see it necessarily unless you're out removed um, from a city but they're they're all over driving through iowa driving through nebraska there there are all these windmills and oftentimes i have driven past and they really they aren't moving or they're moving so slowly i wonder how any energy is Mm -hmm. created from Mm -hmm. it i suppose some is but they really are quite prevalent around the country even if most people don't see them in their metro or suburban areas well that's right and uh of course in many areas now in they're putting solar plantations into virginia and they're cutting down thousands of acres of forests to do it timberland and um the funny thing is, if you look at a map of the United States, there, there are really good maps uh, for uh, wind potential, the windiest places, and also the sunniest places. Virginia it ranks towards the bottom. It's not a sunny place, and yet they're putting up all kinds of solar plantations uh, across the state because of the federal subsidy and because people have told the utilities and the utilities have bought the this that there's an energy transition going on well in fact uh, if you look at, at at energy production the sources of energy uh, the United States has spent trillions of dollars on subsidies for renewable energy and it's had a very small impact in terms of the percentage of energy provided from those renewable technologies. So uh, it used to be there was slightly more than 80% of all energy came from conventional sources. Now it's slightly less than 80%. So the idea that we're going to get to so-called net zero, that we're going to get rid of all of coal, oil, and natural gas, except unless it has what's called carbon capture and storage, where they take the carbon dioxide out of the smokestack and pipe it somewhere and put it in a cave or something. Um, if if we don't have, uh, if we've already spent trillions of dollars and we've only reduced uh, the amount of energy that comes from conventional sources a tiny little bit, you can see as every percentage point gets more expensive because they, they take the, the cheapest things first and the more expensive things later. So we're going to see uh, this whole energy transition is going to come to a grinding halt because it's way too it's it's far too expensive it won't work and uh, nobody will sort of say that the utilities won't say it uh, president biden says the energy transition is here uh, the international energy agency said in a in a report just this week the uh, the energy transition is unstoppable uh, well, it actually isn't even happening. We're just wasting a huge amount of money, and we're creating an electric grid that isn't going to work. It's gonna, we're going to have, instead of a few minutes a, a year average uh, without power, we're going to have hours and hours and hours. The average customer at home is going to have hours and hours and hours without power. A modern economy can't run on on intermittent electricity. No, not at all. Um, Okay, I want to ask a few questions about what you just said, and I want to preface something by saying you said that the the people who run the energy companies won't speak up and say what they know is true, that the, this is going to drive the cost up and the supply down of energy. Essentially, that's what you're saying. Mm-hmm. I worked at a paper company, a, 
a factory, a paper mm-hmm. mill. Um, that was my first career job out of college. I programmed computers. And so I was inside that factory. A lot of people don't know that about me, but I had to wear earplugs mm-hmm. and safety goggles and occasionally s- steel-toed shoes and a hard hat. Uh-huh. So I'm familiar with what a factory is like. When I was working at this paper mill, they decided to build a second machine so that we they were producing two two machines were producing paper at a time instead of one and the factory that i worked mm-hmm. at produced a squiggly paper inside of a cardboard box i spoke to somebody higher up in in my division who worked in finance and said so the reason that this is actually happening and he he drew it on my whiteboard and it just stands out it's something i've always remembered is that we have to get the emissions from our our factory down so if we build a second paper machine the new paper machine has lower emissions and the average across the two Mm -hmm. is lower so we're releasing more emissions into the atmosphere but we've reduced we've on average reduced it and that's acceptable to to the government and i just was like wait a minute what you you're telling me that you know it's going to increase the emissions but it's okay because on a, in, it's <laughs> like makes no sense but this is what we're doing and that's what they wound up doing and so when i hear you say, saying they won't speak up it reminds me of that they're playing these games with the government because the government puts insane regulations on that don't work and don't actually even achieve the goal they're trying to achieve yeah i, I think that's right uh, the uh, of course there are different industries here the oil and gas industry you know has these big oil companies the majors exxon Mobil, chevron shell bp and so on uh, these companies are very uh, susceptible to uh, being pushed around and so they don't their ceos have sh- shareholders and board members that don't want them to get out and say hey i'm really proud of what we do so instead what they do is they they apologize and say we'll do better in the future we're planning to you know uh, reduce our emissions and we're we're part of the energy transition we're on board the the smaller guys are are not like that they're proud to be producing the energy that americans use and, and depend upon uh, but but of course they're just small they don't have big public relations departments. They don't have CEOs that have big public platforms. They're not on TV all the time. So the oil industry is kind of, you know, it's it's solid, but the the majors are too shy or, or they're cowed by uh, political forces. Uh, the, the utilities are, are very different, the electric utilities, because they don't really care where they get their electricity from. They just want to make sure that they're guaranteed a rate of return. And so in most states, uh, a utility, uh, if they build a new expensive plant and close an old plant that still has a lot of life in it, they, that increases their capital spending and therefore they can increase their rates. And so they're not so concerned about uh, the, uh, the, the, the reliability mix that, that really the grid depends on. That is, you need source you need different sources of electricity you shouldn't get it all from the same kind of fuel so what we've seen is that when uh, the obama administration declared war on coal uh, at that time coal produced over 50 percent of the electricity in this country but because of the rules which were later overturned by the supreme court but the utilities went ahead and said, well, we've, we've got these rules coming, so we're going to start closing coal-fired power plants. So now coal is down to 20 or 22 percent of our electricity. Uh, and that was all due to rules which were found to be illegal. So that's that's the kind of world we live in with the utilities. Well, and the administration, um, whichever administration it is, certainly on the left, doesn't seem to care whether what they're doing is right or not legal or not constitutional or not they're like well we'll do it and then if we have to stop we'll stop and even then they don't always stop right that's so, right so they achieve their goal whether it was legal or not they don't they don't care because the ends justified the means yes and it uh, I'll, I'll tell you a, a somewhat amusing uh, or a sad story about that the the rule that really killed coal-fired power plants was called the mercury and air toxin standards or mats rule and that rule 
uh, was found in a, a very strong Supreme Court decision to, to be illegal. It didn't follow what the Clean Air Act said you had to do. Uh, and Gina McCarthy, who at that point was the uh, administrator of the EPA, said publicly, she laughed, she said, ha, 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 it doesn't matter that the rule is illegal and we have to give up on it because the utilities have already complied. So, because of course the court moves slowly, the first has to right. go to the DC Circuit Court, then it goes to the Supreme Court. So it took several years. And by the time the court ruled, the, the issue was essentially dead because the utilities had given up on coal. And, you know, I, I don't really care where we get our electricity from or where what makes our cars go. But what I want is something that's reliable and affordable. And that's what, the, the, the whole war is, on affordable, reliable energy at every, it, not just electricity, but also uh, motor vehicles as well. Okay, let me go back to one more thing and then we'll we'll keep going through some of what yeah. you've talked about, but I wanna go back for just a minute. When they talk about net zero and carbon neutral, it, it, don't trees and plants get rid of carbon dioxide and turn it into oxygen? Yes, uh, the, the uh, carbon dioxide is essential for uh, life on Earth, because plants take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and they use it to oxidize, to take solar energy and turn it into calories that they can use in growing. So CO2 is essential for the greening of the the greenness of the Earth, and without it, we wouldn't be around. So uh, higher CO2 levels, which CO2 carbon dioxide levels are. It's a trace gas in the atmosphere. It's, the atmosphere is mostly nitrogen, then oxygen. CO2 is just a tiny trace gas. So it's thought that uh, before the Industrial Revolution, when uh, they started burning coal in England, that uh, the uh, level of CO2 in the atmosphere was 270 parts per million. That's about, you know, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go forward. Okay. It's now over 400 parts per million. So after a couple hundred years of burning coal, oil, and natural gas, it's gone up from 270 to about 410, 415. And that's uh, essentially one part out of every 2,500 in the atmosphere. So it's, it's a very tiny amount. And it's, it's thought that you know CO2 is a greenhouse gas. It does uh, cause uh, warming. Uh, but the warming has been, uh, uh, the rate of warming has been much lower than what the computer models predict. The data shows mild warming, the computer models show rapid warming. And what, at the same time, because plants use CO2 for photosynthesis, the, the world has been greening. And you can go to the NASA website if you know where to look, and you can find uh, the map, the the satellite photography that shows over time how much greener the Earth is now than it was in '79 when the satellites went up, and so one of the th reasons that food production, you know, they, they keep saying global warming is going to cause food food pr uh, pro uh, production problems, but food production keeps going up. Part of it is, you know, agricultural engineering of better crops. Some of it's better fertilizers, more fertilizer. But some of it is the greening of the earth from higher CO2 levels. And, and so uh, we can thank our, uh, you know, thank CO2 for the fact that uh, food production, global food production, has been able to keep up with global population increase. And that's very important, and we should, we should be grateful that uh, you know, all that coal, oil, and gas is being burned, and more of it is being burned around the world every year. So if the trees are necessary, then isn't it a problem that Virginia is cutting down trees to put in solar plants? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think there's, there are lots of problems. As a rural uh, agro-American, you know, uh, you mentioned that people in cities and suburbs don't even notice that there are wind turbines and solar panels popping up all over the place. But as a, as a rural American, I go home to eastern Oregon and I see these wind turbines and, uh, you know, they're not, they, they, they spoil the landscape. I mean, I can yeah, see- Yeah, they really do. I can see that at some places they might be okay, uh, you know, but 
they really do spoil the landscape. And I think being close to them is very unhealthy, but that's another issue. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an expert on that, but I just I suspect from what I've heard that it's not healthy to be close to these things. Okay, so um, oil and gas, the war on energy. We've got oil and gas, and mm-hmm. then we unpack that one. There are several more areas where they're attacking energy, right? Well, I think the the war on what we call at CEI auto mobility is really uh, the the one that should concern people. Uh, I'd, I'd say first the reliability of electricity and how right. much it costs. The second is the, the attempt to force people out of automobiles or to force them into automobiles that that don't serve their purposes that don't really suit the needs. You know, I, I've rented electric vehicles. I think they're fine. Uh, they have a lot of, uh, of uh, advantages. They have a lot of good things about them. And I think they're really perfect if you own two other automobiles. Now, my family, we raised four children and no, only ever had one car. I, an electric would not have done it. It, would, right. it wouldn't, you know, if we'd owned two, two, you know, if we'd owned a big SUV and a, and a, a, a some other uh, internal combustion engine, and then the third vehicle to commute to work in as an electric vehicle, that would make sense. So what, what the Biden administration is, has done and Congress has done is, They've, uh, they've extended the subsidies for electric vehicles. So anybody who buys one essentially can get $7,500 off the price. And now they're passing rules both at the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, and the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. That's a, that's a lot of words, but NHTSA. The, these are the people that do the CAFE standards, the Corporate Average Fuel Economy Standards. So we now have cafe standards for uh, mileage for automobile efficiency for how many miles per gallon a car gets and and then we have epa rules for the greenhouse gas emissions for the car and you combine those two and what it means is that the automakers have decided and they've they haven't fought it but they've decided that they will not be able to comply with these rules and keep producing internal combustion engines or diesel engines and that's why the big automakers, not Toyota, but the Ford, GM, uh, several of the others, have announced that by 2035 they will stop producing internal combustion engines and only produce electric vehicles. Well, as I said, uh, they're good as a third vehicle in a family, but they're not so good if you need just have one and you need it for everything, and particularly for rural people. Right who need big rigs, who have to haul stuff, who have to drive long distances, who have to uh, work in cold weather and in hot weather. Uh, I think, you know, if people are just commuting back and forth a set number of miles a day, an electric vehicle might might be okay. But for people in, in uh, and you know, the, the kinds of people who who actually work, you know, we found out during the shutdown who was important. It's the people who, you know, drive the trucks that bring the food. It's the people. Right. I mean, those people can't. They're not going to get along with electric vehicles. So this this is a, a very serious because the automakers have bought into it, and and they're already changing their employment. The the kinds of engineers that they employ, uh, the kinds of, of of development programs that they have. And so we're going to be, I think, left with an auto industry that's a complete car wreck. Uh, and and consumers are going to say, hey, where's the car that I want? Well, and they're doing that right now. Those I've seen videos on online. I haven't gone and looked at the, the um, car dealerships myself, but I've seen several videos online where the, the, there'll be a, a, a Ford dealer, for instance, and there are all the electric cars are on the lot, but you can't get a gas-powered car, and nobody wants the electric cars. Yeah, I, and yeah. I don't understand. Just as a consumer, I, I, my car, my, both of my cars are paid off. I have twins; they share a car. I have a car, mm-hmm. and my car is a 2012, so it's mm-hmm. it's an older car. I travel a lot, so there's not a lot of mileage on it, it as as much as there could be, but. I don't want to buy a car that I, um, after five years or f- or three to five years, have to replace the battery, and the cost of the battery is more than the cost right. of a car right now. I don't, I, I don't want to be. I do not want to have perpetual car payments. Yes, and I think one of the the the, the thing I would add to that is that 
uh, everybody knows that EVs are more expensive than conventional uh, cars. Even with the subsidy, they're still more. They're more expensive. And the subsidy, of course, the, the automakers capture that. They, they raise the price to take right. account of that the consumer's going to get $7,500 back. But what the automakers are doing is they are raising the prices of internal combustion engine cars in order to pay for the losses on EVs. So uh, I, I forget which quarter it was, but Ford announced that it had lost something like $32,000 per vehicle, uh, electric vehicle that they sold. Well, they they have to make that up by raising the prices of conventional cars. And I don't know if you've noticed, but con the, the prices of, of conventional cars are just through the roof. I mean, you go and it's, it's a sticker shock is, is putting it mildly. And, and of course, if you need a big rig, if you need a pickup truck, for example, uh, you know, you're talking $60,000 for a new pickup truck. I mean, who, who, rural people, uh, working Americans can't afford that. And uh, so that that's caused the price of used vehicles to go up. And so people are even being priced out of used vehicles. Right. So there's an effort to really get people out of automobiles and say, well, that everybody can take public transport. It, and it's just not realistic. It I is mean, in a few places. It, it is in San Francisco, for the downtown people who, D.C. For who live a, in ivory yeah. towers, absolutely. Yeah. But most people don't live in ivory, that's ivory right. towers. That's right. But the, but the people running the agenda – they don't know that because they live in ivory towers. And so uh, we, we have a bunch of people who think that they can plan a, a new uh, organization for society that doesn't involve automobiles for most people. Only wealthy people will have automobiles and everybody else can take the bus. It's just absolutely maddening. Um, Oh, and one thing that I've noticed, I've, I've spoken to a few Uber drivers in my travels in the last right. few months, and two different Uber drivers, and I have many a week, so two isn't a huge number, but still right. these stand out to me, um, told me that they had been driving 18-wheelers and that they owned their own rig so uh -huh. so they had that and then they had problems and the supply chain is messed up due to covid and they've gone to try to buy a new one and it's just too expensive and so their old one just basically is retired and they can't get it repaired and they can't use it and they can't buy a new one so now they're driving uber with their their car that they had at home and that concerns me because <laughs> yes. if there are other people yes, like that yes, who are yes. independent owner operators yes. that means our our products aren't moving around our country which exacerbates the supply chain problems absolutely and uh i think uh the place to look for uh, where we're going is california because california has put a lot of new uh, uh, uh standards on freight trucks right and what the freight truck industry has done is they have to, wherever possible they have moved to nevada or arizona across the border or southern oregon and their drivers drive every day into california to do their their freight trucking and so they've vastly increased the cost because of the hundreds of miles that they have to drive from from say you know western nevada the say reno into into the Bay Area. Uh, so uh, this is where we're going. Uh, but of course, once it becomes national, you won't be able to escape California. You'll, everywhere will be like California. Which is why we have to fight this. <laughs> um, okay, and we talked about power plants, yes. right? And then uh, appliances. Yes. Th that is the one that I think really just people feel yes. the most because no matter whether you're in the rural or the metropolitan areas, you, you're everyone, not going to ban my gas stove. Right. Yes. That's right. That's right. And they're after gas stoves. They're after what else? I mean, the list goes on. <laughs> Light bulbs. The list goes on and on. Well, this has been going on for a long time. The Energy Policy uh, and Conservation Act of 1975 set cafe standards for automobiles, mileage standards for automobiles and then efficiency standards for any appliance that the Department of Energy wants to set a, a standard for. So there's hundreds of standards, and every five years they're supposed to review them. Uh, and they, they've, what they've been doing, uh, both the Obama administration and now the Biden administration, is they just ignore the law, which is 
the law says that you can make uh, require that an appliance be more efficient uh, if it doesn't seriously impact uh, the cost to the appliance and the uh, the reliability of the appliance. So what we have are standards for dishwashers, washing machines, refrigerators, furnaces, gas stoves, microwave ovens. So we could go down the list. But what's happened is, and I'm sure you are as aware of this as I am, uh, you know, dishwashers aren't as good as they used to be. Washing machines don't. Washing machines are awful. Are now they're trying to ban gas stoves. Some some communities, some like you know Berkeley, California, and New York City, are, are just banning gas stoves. Um, and so we are we are now living with less good appliances than we had 20 years ago. They they don't last as long. They cost more, and they don't perform as well. And this is this is all due to the Department of Energy, and it's all due to the aggressive nature of, of the Obama and the Biden administrations. Now, during the Trump administration, the Department of Energy did something that uh, we at CEI had actually proposed. My Our, our general counsel, Sam Kasman, uh, found that uh, you could petition the department to create a new class of appliances and that that could then be regulated. So he proposed and the department under Trump agreed to create a new class of fast dishwashers that would get the job done in le- in an hour or less and that these would have different efficiency ratings than the dishwashers we have now, which typically take well over two hours right. and don't get your dishes that clean. So the, the Trump administration actually pr- promulgated regulations to create a new class of fast dishwashers, and of course Biden canceled it immediately. So. Uh, that was I, that was clever. It's a nice, you know, right. we, we, you we, know, it's the kind of thing that might have some. We might make progress in the future with that. Yes, and what we really made progress with is if we had a Republican House and a Republican Senate, and they passed a law that actually ended all of this and attached it to a spending bill and made it permanent, and a president who would sign it into law, so we could get rid of some of these regulations because yes, they were. Right. Onerous and the swing from one administration to another creates instability in the entire market and chaos everywhere. Mm-hmm. And we need laws to get to just get rid of yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. And then we need people who will stick to the law and punishments um, to um, administrative people who won't stick to the law to the yes. bureaucrats. I was speaking to a man who does heating and air in the area where I live last. Well, if you, in the, about 10 months or so ago, so in the, the winter time, and we were talking about the ban on gas stoves. He doesn't know what I do. Um, uh-huh. I have to send him a copy of this podcast. But he was telling me they are going to get rid of gas stoves, and then they are going to come after your refrigerator, and then mark my words, they are coming after your your water heaters and ultimately your air conditioners. And let me tell you, Freon is through the roof. You used to be able to buy canisters of coolant i suppose it's free on but you used to be able to buy it for like less than ten dollars and now it's over 80 or 90 dollars and he said they're coming for all of it the refrigerators that they're making now are more explosive and will catch on fire and he sent me all these links about it because i listened very attentively yes. so he came yes. back and was sending yes. me all this information and so each time a new iteration has happened i've just sent him a link and he's like told you told you <laughs> and and he's right if if we don't get a handle on this they're going to come after all of it and our lives are going to be so much worse it's not like we can't live without all of those appliances yeah. but they make our lives more efficient they make our lives less painful and they they make our lives more enjoyable and the government shouldn't be just pounding us down and preventing us from having things that make our life better well you live in the south where it gets kind of hot in the summer in many places and uh so what's made life possible in the south and why so many people have moved there is air conditioning that's right and air conditioning became uh, available i think the first place that was air conditioned was in the 1920s it was the u.s capitol building of course it was the capitol well, it, it was, <laughs> but that's well, fine well a, a guy named carrier invented this new technology right. to cool cool a, a room and they they got it in the because obviously washington dc in the summer is one of the 
more miserable Swampy. places you can be. And then it got to movie theaters. And then after World War II, it started to be found in people's homes, businesses. You know, banks got air conditioning, office buildings got air conditioning. And so it's been a remarkable transformation of our society. I mean, life is so much more comfortable. So the war on air conditioning, I'm glad you brought it up because it's very important. And CEI has been very involved in fighting it. Uh, there's this treaty called the Montreal Protocol. And the Montreal Protocol has an amendment called the Kigali Amendment, and uh, it, uh, the Montreal Protocol took a kind of refrigerant called CFCs and banned those because of their uh, uh, claim that they were causing the ozone hole. So CFCs were replaced by HFCs, and the Kigali Amendment bans HFCs and requires some other kind of refrigerant. The most common one are called HFOs. So why, why has this happened? Well, the, the companies that produce CFCs, the patents had run out on CFCs, but uh, companies like uh, DuPont and, uh, and Honeywell, uh, th 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 there were different names, but they've acquired them. So we'll just call them Honeywell and DuPont, or Honeywell and Comores, maybe we should say. Okay. Those two companies, had the patents on HFCs, but those patents ran out, and they have patents on these new things called HFOs. So they make a lot more, but the problem, CFCs to HFCs was, uh, you know, it's more expensive, but they're about as efficient in terms of their refrigeration capacity. HFOs are not as efficient, therefore it requires more electricity to actually run and get the room cool or the refrigerator cool. They have other problems. That some of them are flammable. They'll catch on fire. And so we're now faced with a, a crisis in air conditioning because conventional air conditioners that run on Freon or things related to Freon, those chemicals are now going way up in price because they've been banned and the production has to go down every year. So people who have air conditioning units are going to face much higher repair bills, and that's already happening. Uh, my colleague Ben Lieberman has talked to people in the industry and uh, repairmen, and they say, yeah, it's going to cost you know, an extra several hundred dollars every time you need to get your AC repaired. And then the, if you have a new unit, you're looking at much higher costs for the new unit and less reliable, won't last as long, and so we're, the government is destroying the air conditioning industry. And this is all due to the ratification by the Senate on a bipartisan basis, although it was overwhelmingly Democrats. But, but the, one of the leaders was Senator Bill Cassidy of Louisiana because they have big Honeywell plants in his state. And so the, the Senate ratified the Kigali Amendment even though – it's going to do all of this damage to our, our uh, air conditioning, which we all take for granted. It's, and it's, it's cars, too. I'm sure you've noticed that new cars have these huge intakes in front, right? Yeah. These gigantic right. intakes. That's because the refrigerant is not as efficient as the old refrigerant. I've also noticed that a lot of the new cars that I'm renting, they, they aren't as cool or right. they they turn off when you stop and i'm sure there's a way to fix it but on the rental car yeah. they have it locked in, in yes. and you know if you're in phoenix arizona yeah. and it's 112 and the car's Perfect. air conditioning quits working it's not pleasant it, at all yeah. but in and cassidy is from louisiana it gets really, really hot, hot in louisiana yeah. the, it's just they are so short-sighted sometimes they blow my mind congress is just <laughs> drives me insane. Um, it, we're recording this in the middle of the speaker fight, so I'm really just <laughs> on edge about them anyway. Um, okay, two, one comment and then two more questions for you. The comment is the same repair man told me that when it comes to the gas stoves, getting rid of the gas stoves, that in newer neighborhoods, it's not as much of a problem, but in older neighborhoods, the, gr the house is connected to the grid, whatever the electricity is, it's taking it to the grid. Inside your house, you don't, most 
a lot of older houses do not have the electricity, and maybe even some of the newer ones don't have the electricity to be able to support a gas, a, an electric stove, and an electric water heater, and whatever, mm -hmm. maybe an electric air conditioner. I don't even know what they're going right. to do with that. I, I guess it is electric a heat somehow. Pump. Get, okay. Get, get, replace your gas furnace with a heat pump. So if you start replacing all of that, then you're going to wind up having to rewire inside of your house and you're going to have to change what is going from the road to your house. So replacing a gas stove, it may look like on the surface when you go to buy it, a thousand, a couple thousand dollars at the store, but by the time you actually can get it installed, you might be looking at 10 grand. And it isn't even an upgrade for your house. It's just an appliance that you need. And homes that have gas stoves are going to wind up being more valuable anyway. Yes, you're absolutely right. Okay. The the two questions, or go ahead. Do you have some? No, no. I, I mean, just, you put it very, I mean, you explained it well. I mean, the problem is that the grid is designed for a certain type of, of housing with you know gas stoves, gas water heaters, gas furnaces. And if we move to electric vehicles and you need an electric charger, that needs you're going to need an upgrade to, to have a you know 240 instead of 120 uh, outlet for that charger. Then if you get rid of the gas stove, the gas furnace and the gas water heater, you're going to have to have uh, another more upgrades. So, yes, it's going to cost a lot of money. It, it just it, it, it's it's short sighted um, for the politicians, especially Republicans who are allowing this to happen. It's they're harming their own constituency and and the liberals and the leftists who want want to get rid of of the energy that works efficiently and affordably, it, it, it's their goal anyway. So they don't they don't care one way or the other. Um, China, do, do, what is China doing? I'm sure they're they're very clean and efficient and following all the same standards as the rest of the world, right? Well, China talks a good game. Uh, they belong, uh, like the United States and every other country in the world, to the Paris Climate Treaty. And they uh, talk at every meeting. We've got the uh, annual conference of the parties, uh, COP28, coming up in, uh, in uh, the United Arab Emirates in, in December. Late, late November and early December. They, come, they go and they say that, yes, we're planning to uh, cut our greenhouse gas emissions from uh, carbon dioxide from burning coal, oil, and natural gas. Uh, and then they go back and they build a lot more coal plants and natural gas plants. So China now uh, uh, consumes 50% uh, of the world's coal production uh, and uh, coal production is now at a global all-time high, primarily because of increases in Chinese consumption. So their emissions, their CO2 emissions from burning coal have gone up and up and up, and it, they go to the UN meetings and talk a good game. So that's, that's what China is about. Now, people say that China is, you know, it's dirty there and they have dirty energy. I don't, I don't, I don't really buy that. Yes, they have very serious pollution problems because they've, They've got a, a highly concentrated population that is moving up. Their standard of living is moving up, so they're using a lot more energy. But um, they're building very modern coal plants. They're not building, you know. Okay. We have old coal plants because we've stopped building them a long time ago. We have, you know, ancient ones. China has, uh, I think we have one, what's called ultra supercritical. That's where they grind the coal up so it's just like dust, so it burns very efficiently. I think we have one of those plants, the most advanced kind of coal plant. China has about over 100. So uh, that's, uh, they're, they're modernizing, where, whereas we're uh, letting our equipment become antiquated. Now, of course, we're moving to natural gas, which does burn cleaner, and we have modern natural gas plants. But one of the, the odd things about the rules being pushed by the, the Biden EPA for power plants is it, it would make uh, what are the most modern plants, which are called combined cycle, uh, it would make them very hard to comply with the, the new reg the standards. But instead, uh, backup gas plants, which are single cycle, which they turn on whenever they Whenever the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining, they'll have a backup gas plant. Those would still be okay, but they're not nearly as efficient or clean as the modern combined cycle. So it's it's kind of ironic what's it's going like on. It's like building two a second paper 
yes, machine that's right. to reduce emissions, yet you're increasing that's, emissions. That's right. The the thing that is frustrating to me about what's happening in China versus what is happening here is that we are creating such a regulated and onerous regulatory environment, and it prevents manufacturing here, and it takes away jobs here, because in order to manufacture here, you have to comply with the EPA and OSHA. And yes, it, so all, all, of the, all of the alphabet agencies. And by the time that you've done all of that, the cost is so much higher. And then China just sidesteps all those regulations and has slave labor and everything else. And it, it makes it impossible for, for us to compete with them. And then they're, they're producing using the kind of energy that, that people here are saying we have to get rid of, yet they're using that energy to produce the cars that people are driving. And, the, they sol- think and the solar panels and right. the wind turbines and yeah, the, the the iron, so- there's an irony in that. Yeah, the the, the solar panels are produced. Uh, uh, it, it's claimed using a lot of forced labor, uh, and uh, the uh, the critical minerals involved. Uh, you've heard of critical mineral. The critical minerals are the ones that are needed to create this new energy economy. So solar panels, wind turbines, electric vehicle batteries. And so cobalt comes from Congo and it's produced using, you know, 10 year olds in going down into the mines. So it's child forced child labor that cobalt is then processed in China. So China, China doesn't produce, uh, doesn't doesn't dominate the production of all of these metals, but they do dominate the processing. So, uh, for example, uh, there was a big mine uh, pr- uh, proposed, a copper and gold and, and rare earths mine up in Alaska called the Pebble Project, which in fact the Trump administration stopped right at the end of Trump's term. Uh, it was outrageous that they did it, but that all of the gold, all of the metal all of the mining all of the ore would not be processed in the united states it would be shipped to asia because our environmental rules mean that you can't build a new smelter in this country it, it, <laughs> we're just we're we're shooting ourselves in the foot sometimes yes often yes yes not just and sometimes. we're becoming a second class you know economic power we have to fix that. Yes. Now, the last question is, what can the average person do? Well, uh, that's always the best question, but of course, some of the answers aren't particularly convincing or, or powerful. I would say this, there isn't much that people can do on the production of, energy, of coal, oil, and gas. I mean, that's an industry versus government thing. On the vehicle front, uh, the, trying to force people into smaller electric cars instead of cars that meet their needs. I think people need to get really angry about that, and they need to talk to their elected officials, not just in Congress, but state officials, county commissioners, city councilmen, and say, this isn't going to work. This does not meet. I need choice. I need to be able to choose the kind of vehicle that suits me and my family. And then they should talk to their auto dealers, because if if you've had a, a long relationship with a particular dealer who sells a particular kind of car, you ought to go and say, "Hey, look, I can't afford this car, and it and moreover, it doesn't meet my needs. So, what is your industry going to do about it?" And I, I think so. The dealers need to be put on the spot. And then in terms of electric reliability and electric rates going up at the same time that reliability is going down, this is something that that the utilities for a long time have dominated state legislatures many in many states. Mm-hmm. And I think people have to start complaining to their their state legislators uh, that, you know, look, this 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 racket that's been created is not it's okay so far because rates haven't gone up that much yet and reliability hasn't gone down that much yet. But I can see that what's happening, it's gonna be 
uh, we're all going to be like California and Texas. We're going to have days and days without electricity, and we can't live that way. We can't have a modern economy. We can't run our lives without electricity. And so I think that the state legislatures in some states uh, have – there's some – ability to push back. And then the other thing is we have to we have to work on Congress to repeal the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. Every Republican voted against it, and last spring the Limit Save Grow Act pushed by the House Freedom Caucus, every Republican voted for that bill, Limit Save Grow repealed the subsidies, the the energy subsidies in in the Inflation Reduction Act. So there is support, and the leader on this is Chip Roy from Texas, and of course he's one of the great leaders in Congress. But Chip Roy gets it, and, and I don't know if you've heard him speak about this, but he gets what's going to happen if we go down this road of subsidizing uh, unreliable and expensive energy at the expense of conventional energy, which is where we get all our energy from. And so uh, we need to get rid of the Inflation Reduction Act, and people should talk to their members of Congress. If it's a Republican, you should say, I really, uh, in the House, say, I, it's great that you voted to get rid of those subsidies. Keep at it. Keep don't don't forget about you know you voted once but you need to keep <laughs> you need going to keep, keep going even if it takes a couple of years till it yeah, happens perseverance is what makes polit political change happen it's it's not giving up we we can't give up on this we have to say these subsidies have to go and if 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 you know with the kind of leadership that we have on this and the fact that the whole Republican conference has gone along with it in the House and quite a few in the Senate, I think we have a good chance of, of uh, changing the direction of the country. Well, that should give people hope. And it, it is tough because we just have to keep going and going and going. And we just want to win and be done with it and be able to go live our lives. That's but right. we can't. We, the way to be able to live our lives is to, to stay on the activism and never give up. You're right, Jenny Beth, and you're one of the great leaders. Well, thank you so much. And Myron, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. That was Myron Ebel, and he is a senior fellow at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm Jenny Beth Martin, and this is The Jenny Beth Show. The Jenny Beth Show is hosted by Jenny Beth Martin, produced by Kevin Mooneyhan, and directed by Luke Livingston. The Jenny Beth Show is a production of Tea Party Patriots Action. For more information, visit TeaPartyPatriots.org. If you like this episode, let me know by hitting the like button or leaving a comment or a five-star review. And if you want to be the first to know every time we drop a new episode, be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications for whichever platform you're listening on. If you do these simple things, it will help the podcast grow, and I'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much.